My affirmative, Ben Hurd, to address the House. Thank you very much. I first began looking into the future of energy a few years ago when I was doing a number of projects in climate change adaptation. Climate change adaptation being the process of looking at what we know and understand now about climate change and what's coming and trying to plan to meet that challenge. There are a few better ways of getting to understand the problem of climate change than working in adaptation. And what I learned in that process disturbed me quite greatly. We have at the moment and on our current pathway so much change coming down the pipeline that we are going to reach a point where the concept of adaptation ceases to apply. And instead we will start talking and thinking about concepts like survival and hanging on. And it concerned me to find more and more evidence that that point was probably approaching in this century that we're in now. At the same time, I was doing a number of projects in the mitigation space, being efforts to bring down those emissions to make that adaptation challenge more attainable. And I learned something equally concerning. In the suite of options that I was looking at, being renewable energies, energy efficiencies and carbon offsetting, without some extra major additional force to come in and help the effort, these solutions were not going to so much as touch the sides of meeting this problem. And this was deeply concerning to me. Renewable energies are growing very, very quickly, but from a very low base. Energy efficiency works and works well, but it's slow and incomplete and imperfect. Offsetting is a very good short-term strategy where a lot of good can be done, but currently our government is treating it like a long-term strategy out to 2050, and for a range of reasons, that's destined to fail very badly. I needed to come back and look at an option that I hadn't permitted myself to see up to that point, which was nuclear power. I had never discussed nuclear power with my colleagues or my student peer group, except in anything other than fairly disparaging terms about why it wasn't required. In three years of doing a Masters of Sustainability at one of Australia's best universities, it was never discussed as a potential option for meeting the climate change challenge in Australia. I had to come back and take myself on a research journey about nuclear power to see whether or not it could meet that gap. And what I learned amazed me. I found out, first of all, that it is a zero carbon power source, at least to the exact same extent that we regard renewable energy sources as a zero carbon power source. This has been repeatedly assessed and demonstrated. I thought the opposite. I was wrong. The idea that nuclear power is high carbon across the life cycle is a false meme. I found, contrary to everything that I thought I knew, that nuclear power is the safest major energy source in the world. Again, this has been repeatedly assessed and demonstrated. The energy-related severe accident database maintained in Switzerland looks at every accident across the whole energy chain of different energy sources, and it gives a clear finding. Nuclear is safer than coal, safer than oil, safer than gas, and safer than hydropower by a long margin. Major actuarial studies by the European Union give the same finding. Say what you like about actuaries, they're pretty unemotional in the way they do their work. <laughs> they let the numbers do the talking, and the numbers talk very clearly and give that finding. I learned that ionising radiation is a hazard, but nothing like the hazard that I had believed it to be. And even in the context of a major accident that we have all been witness to, where a double natural catastrophe wallops ageing reactors and we have an unscheduled, unplanned release of radiation, the findings from the World Health Organisation that have come in now are clear. The dose exposures for that accident are low, really low. And frankly, in terms of illness stakes and things that we have to worry about, no offence to ionising radiation, it just doesn't rate not alongside things like consuming too much red and processed meat, tobacco illness, or just boring old air pollution. Indoor air pollution, predominantly from cooking smoke, from those people too poor to afford electricity of any kind, 
claims two million lives every year, a lot of them children. Outdoor air pollution from the combustion of fossil fuels predominantly is responsible for 1.3 million deaths every year. If we want to make smart and intelligent choices on our energy and climate future, we have got to learn to measure our monsters and make sure we pay attention to the big ones. I didn't have an informed position on radiation. What I had more resembled a phobia. When I realised this about nuclear power, that it was clean in all sorts of ways, I realised we could have a future without air pollution. Nuclear power doesn't just emit no carbon dioxide, it emits no sulphur dioxide, nitric oxides, soot, heavy metals that fossil fuel emits run of the mill, business as usual, every day. And what I saw most of all was the full-scale answer to that large-scale problem of climate change, an energy source that could replace coal, oil and gas. It has everything that we need from fossil fuels as an energy source, wholly reliable, wholly dispatchable, very portable, but without the pollution. What about spent nuclear fuel, you might say? Please understand and appreciate, waste is waste. Pollution is waste that is uncontained and in the environment, free to do damage to human health and the environment. Nuclear power plants produce a manageably small quantity of waste, which is then contained. Fossil fuel plants pollute, and they do that as business as usual, and we have all simply come to accept it. I know which of these two environments I would like to raise my two children in. It's the one without the pollution. And what's more, what is spent nuclear fuel? It is predominantly uranium, some plutonium and other actinides, and a very small amount of what's known as fission products. A completely different reactor design called the Integral Fast Reactor, which is paired with a reprocessing facility, can consume every atom of all of that uranium, all of that plutonium and actinide, and give us zero carbon energy in return. This increases the energy output of mined uranium by 250 times. That means we have enough fuel sitting around in the form of depleted uranium and high level spent fuel to power the entire world right now for centuries. That means potentially the end of energy mining if we want it. People like to tell me that the IFR isn't real. The IFR is real. At the World Energy Forum in Dubai this year, the integral fast reactor will be the focus of the nuclear energy discussion program. And if you visit Idaho, you can go to the Argonne National Laboratories where the reactor was built, demonstrated, tested and proven over a period of 10 years. When I really had a hard look at nuclear power, what I saw staring back at me were my own prejudices, my own biases, my blocks, my ignorance and my indoctrination. What I see now potentially are two energy futures. One is more or less more of the same. Much more renewables, more nuclear, but a more or less unshaken dominance of fossil fuels. And in that future, I see the serious risk of a runaway climate in this century with serious impacts. Collapsing food supplies, wholesale loss of ecosystems and dangerous sea level rise. Or I see an incredible future, a future without air pollution, a future where we are running on nuclear waste as fuel, a future where we have a fighting chance of winning back a stable climate. The difference between these two scenarios less or more nuclear, more or less climate change. We have choices to make. I have seen this energy future, but it's going to take some creating. I hope I might have been able to convince some of you to do the creating with me. Thank you. Dr. Yoshida.